All right, well, good morning, and once again, welcome to Central Baptist Church. My name is Les DeGolier, and I have been a deacon here at Central for about four years now, as well as serving in the area of small groups coordinator for eight years or so. Before I get into what God has laid on my heart for today, I would like to share with you how grateful I am to serve in a church with a pastor and other leadership that desire to follow hard after God no matter what's going on outside of these four walls. Leadership that's also willing to tackle all of the topics and truths that are found in God's Word and then teaching how we can make application in our own lives. I believe that God is blessing this church because of our faithfulness to Him, and we need to be sure not to take that for granted. Well, for a little more background about me, I've been married to my wife, Holly, for about 10 years now, and we have four children, Natalie, Micah, Charlotte, and our newest, Samuel. I'm also a math teacher in a public high school. Uh, in al- I teach mostly algebra, and I also am a varsity baseball coach as well as a varsity football coach in which I'll explain a new role that I'm taking on in a little while. Well, a few weeks ago, Pastor Ben sent me a text message asking me if I'd be willing to do a message in this series, and before I could reply and pass it off as some sort of joke, he sent a follow-up text and said, yes, I'm serious. (laughs) So, (laughs) well, you might think that for somebody who has to get up in front of a hundred or so teenagers day after day, that this would be similar. This isn't math. To be tasked with rightly dividing the Word of God from the pulpit on Sunday morning is both humbling and intimidating. It's interesting how God works, though, because I had just told the baptism class that I was leading a few weeks ago that when God is stretching you and you know that it's Him, that despite any doubts or fears you have, you really need to accept the challenge. You need to step up and watch how God grows you. Little did I know that God was going to stretch me in a real big way a couple weeks later. But in all seriousness, I knew my advice was sound, and I can see clearly when I look back on certain events how God has used them to grow me to who I am today, all for His glory. So my decision was already made, and here I am. Well, before we dive into the armor of God, I wanted to share something that I've started to see popping up in my profession as of late. Last week, Pastor Ben shared a little bit more as he reviewed the belt of truth, and he added some thoughts. He talked about how the media has had an outright and deliberate attack on truth, and it has affected many areas of our lives. Well, if you caught my profession at the beginning, I said I was a math teacher. So you might be thinking, well, less. Math? Math is absolute. It's non-negotiable. And I thought the same thing, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why I became a math teacher. But recently, I read an article, actually from March 4th in the New York Times, that had something different to say. Here's a couple of quotes from that article. The first says, The concept of mathematics being purely objective is unequivocally false, and teaching it even much less so. Upholding the idea that there are always right and wrong answers perpetuate objectivity as well as fear of open conflict. Second quote says this, white supremacy culture shows up in math classrooms when the focus is on getting the right answer. This was published in a bunch of other periodicals as well. You might be thinking, well, come on, Les, there's no way that this type of curriculum is going to make its way into the public high school domain. Well, later on in the article, it says how curriculum with this as a focus has already been implemented on the West Coast in California, Oregon, and Washington. Make no mistake, there is a war on truth these days, and no subject area is off limits. As Christians, we need to be prepared to give truth for all areas of life. Our God is a God of truth, All truth begins and is given from him. The U.S. has gotten to this point because, generally speaking, Christians have lived a comfortable life and sat on the sidelines of a war on truth while the enemy has been active. Many have held to the belief that we need to be only concerned with spiritual truths and we should stay out of the rest of it. 
I believe this is not only incorrect, but it's not biblical. It's time that Christians get off the sidelines and stand up for all truth because our God is concerned with all of it. Well, before we transition to our fourth piece of armor for today, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us as Christians to stand for truth. Father, you are a God of truth. We pray that you would give us boldness as we speak. Help us to speak in love and in mercy. We pray, Lord, that we would be a light to the world around us, wherever you've placed us. And now as we consider the armor of God, help us to take up the armor daily. Help us to learn how we can apply these truths to our lives and live a life for you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, today we're going to take a look at the fourth piece of armor, but before we do that, let's review the three pieces that we have learned about in the last couple of weeks. The first piece that we learned about was the belt of, tr belt of truth, which is honesty with God, and it's used to help defend and attack using deception from our enemy. The second piece is the breastplate of righteousness. The purpose is to do what's right, and it helps us to defend against an inward or self-focus. And third, the third one we went through was the shoes, which is our position in Christ and is used to help us to defend against doubts that the enemy would give us. Well, if you're new here, you might be wondering what this oddly dressed mannequin is doing over here next to me. And uh, so we have just some, some, uh, a picture image of, of some of the pieces of armor that we have here. First, a weightlifting belt that serves for our belt of truth. I know a guy that can get some shoulder pads, so we have the, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. We also have the shoes here. I think these are Pastor Ben's cleats. And then finally this week, we have a shield of faith, Captain America. Very colorful, probably more colorful than the Roman shields. Um, but it will serve as a good picture of what we're talking about today. Our fourth piece of armor is the shield of faith. And it's used to defend against Satan's lies and temptations. Well, Pastor Ben had gone over three points in previous weeks, and I'd like to review them now. They are, number one, continually rely on God's strength. Number two, put all of the armor on. And number three, know your enemy. What I'm going to be talking about today deals heavily with the third point. We need to know our enemy and we didn't need to know his tactics that he would use against us. Well, since I'm about to step into my new role as defensive coordinator uh, for the Olean Varsity football team, I thought a sports analogy would be fitting. We know that our pastor likes to use them, so I thought I could get away with it too. As a defensive coordinator, your job is to look at film of the next team's offense and study it. Your job is to look at them play by play Look at the tactics that they will use. Look at what formations and plays and strategies they will unfold as they seek to score. My job will be to then prepare a defense that will defend against them within the framework of our team and try to keep them from scoring and keep them out of our end zone. This is very similar to what we're going to be talking about today. We need to know Satan. We need to know his tactics. We need to know his tricks, his schemes, and we need to put on the full armor of God so that we are equipped to do battle. The armor in Ephesians 6 explains six pieces. Five of them are defensive. These pieces of armor are not for attacking Satan, but they are to help us to withstand his attacks on us and to stand firm. Revelation 12.11 tells us that the saint's role is not to defeat Satan, Instead, we're to overcome him. And Revelation 20.10 says that Satan's ultimate defeat will come at the hands of our God. It's interesting that when you think about putting on the armor of God, this is an act that must be done daily. I highly doubt that the Roman soldiers slept in all of their armor, right? We need to get up and we need to put on the armor of God. We need to prepare ourselves to rise each day and live a life that is honoring to him. And it starts with immersing yourself in God's word, reading the Bible. 
It also should start in prayer and spending time in fellowship and communicating with him. Well, if you haven't already done so, you can open your Bibles to Ephesians 6, and we'll take a look at verse 16 today. Ephesians 6, 16. It says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one. Some of, them even, some of the translations even say flaming missiles or flaming arrows. <clears throat> to get a better idea of what Paul is communicating here to the Gentiles, let's talk a little bit about this shield. The Greeks had two types of shields. One that was a little bit smaller and would often be strapped to the arm, and it would be used in up-close or hand-to-hand combat and really mostly defend against sword blows from your enemy. The second type, the type that Paul's referring to here, is larger. So large that if a man were to crouch down behind it, it would pretty much cover their whole body. And it was used to defend against long-distance attacks, again, from flaming arrows that were often dipped in pine pitch and then lit on fire. It also would be covered with leather that was soaked in order to extinguish those flames. If you put them together in a series, it was called a phalanx. And a phalanx sometimes stretched up to a mile wide, and it would not only protect the individual holding the shield, but the individuals next to that person. Okay? I want to talk just a little bit more about that phalanx. A phalanx is only as strong as there are no breakdowns in the series of shields, much like a congregation of believers. We need to be strong and unified against division so that the enemy does not have frontline access to destroy our church. Our nation is so polarized and divided over certain issues of the day, it's, be- it's becoming more and more challenging to maintain unity. As a church, we are to seek unity first, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. Paul is making this declaration as he seeks to point out that there is no division between Jew and Gentile, but I think that we can make application for us today. We are to share in the same faith, have one Lord, one God, the creator of all, and we are to act in concert as one body of believers united by faith in Christ. Well, as we look down to break down the importance of the shield of faith, I want to establish a definition of faith. Faith, for the believer, is trusting in the person of God in his power, and in his promises. The faith that Paul's referring to speaks to a person's trust in God, the faith that leads to salvation, and a faith that carries us in our daily walk. It is a faith that trusts in God to provide all that we need, to live for him day by day and moment by moment. As we look at each piece of armor, there is an emphasis on the application of each piece that we need to be able to put into practice on a daily basis. So once again, the context for our shield, we have the context for our shield and we have a definition of faith. Now let's dive into the shield a little bit more. Again, the shield is to defend against the temptation and lies that the enemy would send our way. And we can use this armor, we can have confidence in God to defend against those attacks. You see, everyone lives each day with some sort of faith, right? Faith that the sun will rise and the earth will keep spinning. Faith that your job will be there tomorrow. Or faith that the oncoming vehicle at over 55 miles an hour will stay on his side of the yellow line. Satan would love to distract us from keeping our eyes on the road so that we end up in harm's way and on the other side of the yellow line. He is truly a great deceiver who roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He would tempt us to rebel against God. He would lure us to sin instead of trusting in God. Sin is often a result of falling victim to Satan's lies and temptations instead of following in obedience and experiencing the blessings of God. I was reminded of a study that Pastor Ben went through recently that talked about sin and the need for guardrails in a person's life. These were predetermined decisions or choices that would be made in advance 
to be sure that we could avoid going off the road and down a path of destruction. If we have predetermined that we won't pick up the cell phone when it rings, no matter the situation or how good of a driver we think we are, we will be less likely to take our eyes off the road and put ourselves into harm's way. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. As a framework for the ways in which Satan desires to use temptation to, to shake our faith, I thought it would be appropriate for us to look at the temptation of Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 4 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put, your Lord, put the Lord your God to the test. Now we see the third temptation here. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. We see Satan's boldness here as he tempts God's own son and attempts to get him to distrust in God's plan, his promises, his provision, and his authority over all creation. Satan tempts Jesus three times and in three different ways. The first way that he tempts him is in the area of satisfaction. He says, command these stones turn to bread, trying to entice Jesus as he's hungry from fasting. The second he tempts him with power. He says, throw yourself down, for he shall command his angels concerning you. Thirdly, he tempts him in the area of materialism. Takes him up on the mountain and says, all of these kingdoms I will give to you. It would seem that Satan's favorite aiming point for his arrows is in the area of temptation. He would try to, to, doubt, try to get us to doubt in God's character. He would deceive us in ways that would have us doubt or ignore the fact that, that God is a just judge or that he's holy, he would then tempt us in some of our most vulnerable areas. These areas would include sexual sin, greed, and success or notoriety. All of these temptations relate to a level of satisfaction in our lives. That leads us to our first point. The enemy wants us to question our satisfaction. Let's take a look at these verses. It says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That is from James 1, verses 14 and 15. This verse is a major warning to us. Satan knows our weaknesses, and those are the areas that he would try to attack. He wants to appeal to our satisfaction. It is in our best interest to shore up these weak areas in our walk so that we do not leave a foothold for our enemy. Well, perhaps the biggest area of temptation is in the area of sexual sin and lust. If we are honest with ourselves, sexual temptation is a daily battle. This world has normalized and even celebrates this area of sin. We have to daily be on guard to what we watch, what we hear. We need to be careful of the situations we put ourselves in with the opposite sex, the social media platforms we are on, and the websites that we visit. Mainstream media is saturated with sexual temptation, and we need to be constantly on guard. 
Well, one of the most notable examples of lust and sexual sin is in the Bible with David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Pastor Ben brought up David's sin last week, but this week we'll look at it from a lens of temptation. If you remember, David initially makes a poor choice. He stays in when kings usually go out for battle. Right? He creates idle time for himself, and this is when Satan would set the trap. In verse 2, you see it's the lust of the eyes that opens the door to a series of sins that include adultery and conspiring to murder Bathsheba's husband. What started as a small sin for David led him further and further down a path of destruction, and Satan used lust to lead him there. And before anyone thinks for a minute that sin doesn't find its way into the church, well, consider the warning that Paul gives the church at Corinth. It's not only apparent that sexual sin was present, but he also writes about how seriously we are to take this area of sin. He explains its effects not only on those who are directly involved, but also the effects of this sin on the church body. It's no wonder why sexual sin is celebrated today. It is a direct attack on marriage and the family. It's a large flaming missile among many that Satan is using to further destroy our nation's commitment to God's design for the family. Well, let's move to our second point. Number one, the enemy wants us to question our satisfaction. And secondly, he wants us to doubt in God's power. An example of Satan attacking the character of God by questioning his power and authority is found right away in Genesis. Here we see Satan tempting Adam and Eve in the garden. What does he say? How does he deceive them? How does he tempt them? If you take a look at Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6, you can see the tactics that Satan employs to cause Adam and Eve to stumble. First, let's look at how the Bible introduces Satan. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Right away, we are warned of how cunning and crafty our enemy is. The King James uses the word subtle in this verse. As we have seen through this study, Satan most often works in sneaky or subtle ways. He wants us to rationalize or justify small decisions that lead us down a path with major consequences. To be sure, he is a very worthy opponent, and his desire to sow division between us and God, or us and the body of believers in the church, is a main goal of his. He cast doubt as to the validity of the word of God and his infinite wisdom. He said to the woman, did God actually say that you shall not eat of that tree? He creates doubt in their minds, like he does in ours, about submitting to God's authority. He goes on to say, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We know, though, that even though Adam and Eve gave into these temptations, we have a Savior, the better Adam, who has overcome our adversary. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is, the devil. That's from Hebrews 2, verse 14. This verse is awesome. <laughs> our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, has stepped down from him, his throne, humbled himself to the point of the cross in obedience to the Father, where through his death and resurrection, we can share in his victory. Satan's fiery darts that he sends our way are often an attempt to get us to doubt his power. The power and authority he has over creation, the power of his redeeming grace, the power he has over sin and death, and the power he has to forgive. God is in power, reigning over all things, and we can take refuge in him. I want to wrap up this thought when it comes to standing firm in the power of God with this great promise. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 27. It says, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. 
For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. We know that God will have the final victory. Satan would also shake our trust in God's promises. This point really piggybacks off Pastor Ben's message from last week. The enemy would have us live a life that is weighed down by the guilt of our sins instead of relying and trusting on God's promises. Satan would desire that we would respond to his temptations instead of responding to the truth of God's word. The Bible says, This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. You can remember this, and this will be our memory verse going forward into next week. I love how it calls our God a shield as it relates to the armor of God. That's from Psalm 18, verse 30. Satan desires for you to be in a mindset where you rely on your own strength, where you do not trust in what God is doing in your life. Instead, we are to have faith, we are to lean into God and into his promises. Here's another one of those amazing promises. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. What a great promise. We see in John 14, as Jesus talks with his disciples and teaches them that he is going to prepare a place for him. This is the greatest promise of all, an eternity spent with Christ, where we will walk in his midst. This only comes through faith, faith in the Savior and his finished work on the cross, where he demonstrated his power over sin and death. We see here that faith in Jesus is not only our current help in this life, but it's our expectant hope that we have in a life to come, absent from this body, but present with the Lord. If you have questions about this faith, I would encourage you to talk to somebody before you leave today so that you can know more about this amazing truth, God's plan of salvation, and the gift of eternal life. I want to wrap up this point with one more passage. It's from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. It says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcame the world, our faith. Once again, we can see that through faith and because of the power of God, we can have victory over this world. That leads us to our final point for today. The enemy wants us to, number one, question our satisfaction. Number two, doubt in God's power. And number three, he wants us to be tempted in the area of materialism. We live in a society that puts a lot of value on how much money we have, the house that we live in, the job that we have. Materialism is highly glorified in our culture. But materialism is really a battle over contentment. Are we content with what God has provided us with? Are we content in the positions that he has placed us? Or are we looking for contentment in the things of this world? When I was writing this, I couldn't help but think about a song that Johnny Cash sang called One Piece at a Time. One Piece at a Time is a a story about a man who sees all these cars around town and he's envious of, of those cars. And so, while working for GM, he devises a plan that he can take one piece at a time, day by day, take it home, and assemble a vehicle. I think it's interesting, you know, we can laugh about this song, but I think there's a good moral here. He is first envious and then justifies his sin, right, by taking just one piece at a time. Listen to what he says. It says, I've never considered myself a thief, but GM wouldn't miss just one little piece especially if I strung it out over several years. He's justifying his sin. And this is definitely a familiar pattern. We find small ways to justify our sins that lead us down a poor path. God tells us in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. 
And then in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth or rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When considering money and materialism, we should also consider our time. Consider the popular statement, time is money, right? Satan would use temptation of financial gain for us to justify the use of our time in ways that would benefit ourselves instead of looking to build up others. The Bible teaches that we are to be intentional with the use of our time. We are to redeem the time. That's from Ephesians chapter 5. And this carries with it the idea that we are to use our time in ways that would serve God and glorify Him. Well, how else can we combat materialism? Our perspective has much to do with this. If we see that what we have is a blessing of God or from God, given to us to be used to glorify Him and to build His church, then instead of trying to build our wealth for our own personal gain, we are more likely to use our resources generously. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Well, here are a few points to remember as we go today. Number one, our faith is a shield that is used to quench the fiery darts of Satan. Number two, we have a Savior who has walked with us. He's been tempted by Satan himself and promises to be with us in our battle over sin. Our Savior has conquered sin and death and lives and reigns and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and we can live in victory over sin because of Him. Well, so you might be thinking, Les, what about the memory verses that we've been doing the last couple of weeks? So remember, I'm a teacher. And when I'm about to give a quiz, I always walk into my room and I see the students studying really quickly, waiting for the quiz to come out so that they know the answers. Well, sometimes I like to wait a while and then give them the quiz. So that's what I did with you guys this morning. I didn't notice anybody studying, but... Our two verses, we have James 4.17 and Romans 8.1. So you can say those with me right now, starting with James 4, verse 17. So for whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And the second one, Romans 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As I highlighted a verse earlier, I mentioned that Psalm chapter 18, verse 30 would be our memory verse going forward into next week. Once again, it says this, This God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in Him. Well, to make one final point, let's go back to the defensive coordinator role that I mentioned earlier. I think one of the most favorite plays that anybody looks forward to is a trick play, right? The Bills offensive coordinator is pretty good at trick plays this year, and they often use them to score, right? Well, what's exciting about a trick play, I think, is the deception that it involves, right? It's it's a play that is designed to look like something else, right? And then, through deception, you get an advantage over the defense, and usually, it leads to good things. Stop and think about that. Isn't that how Satan works against us? But if a defensive coordinator is doing his job and he's scouted the other team, he knows a team's tendencies as far as when and how they will work to deceive or trick the offense. A good coordinator will prepare and look for these things in advance so as not to be fooled. Well, Satan uses certain situations. He has certain tendencies And he tries to take advantage of our nature as human beings. He tries to get us to fall to lust, greed, and the desire for success and notoriety. He tries to catch us off guard. 
But we can be prepared by putting on the armor of God and standing firm in Him. If we take up the shield of faith, if we keep our focus on the truth of God's Word, we are satisfied and content in Him, and we rest in the power and promises of God, we can stand firm as Satan sends his flaming arrows our way, and we will not be shaken. Let's pray. Father, as we go here, help us to be diligent in putting on the armor of God. Help us to be prepared to withstand the flaming darts of the enemy. Help us in our walk. Help us to live in truth and in victory. We are thankful for a Savior who can sympathize with our temptations and weaknesses. We are thankful that he came, went to the cross, defeated sin and death, and is risen and has victory. Father, go with us as we leave and help us as we desire to walk in a way that would glorify you and that brings light to a fallen world. We pray this in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.